We live in a world where we frequently question the authenticity or genuineness of much of what we are confronted with on a day-to-day -day basis. It could be the authenticity of a news article we're reading, or perhaps we're buying a piece of jewelry and we question whether the gemstone is genuine or fake. In a sinful world of deception and lies, the art of counterfeiting anything of value has become commonplace. Sadly, this is no less true within the church, whether that be in leadership where false teachers <coughs> parade as sheep, but inwardly are wolves bringing error into the church, or whether it's in the pew where congregants and members may appear to have a credible faith and testimony whilst under testing, their lives bear no fruit. This is no new phenomenon, and it's the, this concern which James seeks to address in his letter, which we've started reading together tonight. The main theme running through this letter is that of the difference between pure and vain religion, and the indications within our lives which expose our true spiritual condition. So tonight we're going to start a series of studies through, through this book and over the next few weeks I hope to just look uh, at the first chapter together and then as my next series of studies comes around we'll, we'll continue further into the book. Well, before we dive into this first section let's just bring some context uh, to the letter. The author we read in the first verse is James a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Church history has well documented that this is James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ. He was one of the pillars of the church in Jerusalem. And it's worthy of note that as uh, you read through the book, that despite his reputation and his family ties to the Lord Jesus Christ, nowhere in the letter does he actually refer to his physical relationship. But rather he's just content to refer to himself as a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. We read further in verse 1 that James is writing to the 12 tribes who are scattered abroad. And this helps us to, to date the letter to the AD 40s when the early church was still in the main made up of Hebrew believers before the influx of, of Gentile believers really set in. And we read of that in, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. We see in that verse that the believers were scattered because of heavy persecution. And following the, the murder of Stephen, many believers literally had to run for their lives as they were hunted down and imprisoned and killed by none other than the likes of Saul of Tarsus. In, in many ways, the situation seemed to daily go from bad to worse, and it's into this context that James, as one of the senior pastors in Jerusalem, writes this letter. And he writes the letter. Obviously, the people are scattered abroad. He's, he's not knowing whose hand this letter is literally going to fall into. He doesn't know the spiritual state of all his readers. But it's clear that he is deeply concerned about the genuineness of the profession of those within the early Hebrew church. It's startling, isn't it, that that could even be true, that someone might suffer persecution uh, to that extent for a faith which, at its roots, may be counterfeit. How deceitful and desperately wicked our hearts are. Maybe for other readers it was that they were just frightened and weary and tiring in the in perseverance with the, the, the extreme persecution which they were, were suffering and they knew their faith weakened under this testing. Well, whatever the state of the readers, it's this initial greeting which we have in verse 2. Now, in that context, James opens with this stunning sentence, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. So, for the rest of our time, I would like to consider just these first uh, four verses, really. Um, and I'm titling the study, Fruit from the Fire, which I hope will become clear 
as we go along. Fruit from the fire. Spurgeon once said, The furnace of affliction is a good place for you, Christian. It benefits you. It helps you to become more like Christ. And it is fitting you for heaven. It's often the way that we desire the end result of a thing, but fail to understand or we dislike the process required to produce that result. I remember well a a conversation with someone regarding children sitting through a, a whole service on a Sunday morning. Their wish was for their children to sit through church as they'd seen us as a family doing each week. And they were inquiring, well, how, how did you get to that stage? And the answer, which consisted of sharing how we, we trained and, and faithfully disciplined the children, and we prioritize family worship and consistent attendance, that was a process which wasn't accepted very well. And in a similar way as Christians, we desire to see the Lord bearing fruit in our lives, as, as we studied together in Galatians 5, and yet we fail to comprehend and, and we kick against the sanctifying process that causes that to happen. Let's face it, if we're to fruit patience, then, then the Lord will train us in this era by bringing situations into our lives which require patience. Just the same as if we were to learn gentleness, no doubt we'll come into touch with people who require gentle nurturing. And, and how can we develop self-control? How will that be trained within us if the Lord doesn't bring circumstances into our lives that tempt us to anger or lust or discontent? In verses uh, 2, 2 to 4, we have, we have four fruits or benefits which come to us to the true and genuine believer through times of trial and affliction. Fruit from the fire, if you will. Firstly, true Christians are benefited in trial by spiritual family. Note the word brethren there in verse 2. My brethren. James writes to the church and he acknowledges their relationship in Christ as brothers and sisters. We have been adopted by grace into the body of Christ. So often when God brings times of testing into our lives, we experience the love of our spiritual family around us. When trials come, a support system is crucial. When in need, we, we want our brothers and sisters in Christ to be upholding us in prayer and helping us in practical ways. Maybe that's meals or cleaning or childcare. Galatians 6 verse 2 encourages us, doesn't it, to carry each other's burdens. And in this way, we will fulfill the law of Christ. In scriptural terms, the people in the pews around us who are true believers, they are our family. Just like the members of our biological family, we haven't chosen them for ourselves, but they have been chosen for us. And we are therefore inseparably bound to them because we belong to Christ. We belong to his family. And throughout the New Testament, God commands us to mutual care in the local church. The epistles, in, in particular, tell us what it means to be brothers and sisters. And as we read in 1 Timothy 3.15, it teaches us how one ought to behave in the household of God. And we see, don't we, through the many one another's in the letters, how we are to uh, love and be with our spiritual family, with our brothers and sisters. And that's a, that's a study in itself to go through the one another's of Scripture. But uh, these letters remind us that life in God's family for the believer will re reorientate our allegiance, not just on a Sunday, but, but every hour of every day. We see how that the one in trial is blessed by the support around them, and the believers giving support are blessed as they bear the fruit of kindness and gentleness and goodness towards their brothers and sisters in Christ. 
And one of the main ways in which the body cares for and blesses the other members is through prayer. And we, we see that wonderfully pictured in Acts chapter 12. If you just turn to it, I'm just going to read together um, Acts 12 from verse 5 onwards. Where we read, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers. And the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise, quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did, and he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she didn't open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, You are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, It is his angel. Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. He said, Go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. So what do we see here then in, in this passage? We see that Peter is heavily... Uh, under heavy armed guard, which is a trial which we, we have not had to go through. But what do we read in verse 5? Constant prayer was offered by the church. Here is the body at work. And then we re read through the miraculous way in which God brings Peter out of prison. But what's the first thing he does when he comes out? Where does he head? He heads to his spiritual family who were even at that very moment praying for him. And what a joyous surprise it was to them when he, when he arrived. And interestingly, we see that Peter tells the folk to go and tell James and the brethren about what had happened, the very James who's writing this, this letter. So here we see then the body functioning as it should, prayerfully upholding its individual members. How, how is it with you and I then? Are we, are we looking out for those in need in the church body? Are we weeping with those who weep? And when we ourselves come into affliction in times of testing, do we look for the support of church family? Or do we isolate ourselves and withdraw um, and decline help? Do we actively pray for our church and specifically its, specifically its members, especially in times of need? Do we bring our needs to the church for prayer? Or do we deny ourselves and the church the blessing of praying and seeing prayer answered? Do we regularly meet together as a body? Do our children, do the rest of the congregation witness our prayer times and see the love and the care that should be there within the body? Are we witnessing to Christ's love for us as we love those around us. The challenging quote from Joel Beakey, how we treat the church is how we treat Jesus, for the church is his body. There's no such thing as an independent Christian. Let's remember the blessing of being part of the body of Christ, but also our responsibilities within it, as we consider that we ourselves 
can be used by the Lord to be fruit from the fire to our brothers and sisters who are in a time of trial. Secondly, we see the fruit of joy being produced in the believer during times of trial. I'm sure many of you have seen the poster, Keep Calm and Carry On. This poster has been taken and adapted in many different forms, but all taking this line of keeping calm in stressful situations. The Christian's response should go much further than just calmness. James here writes that we should be joyful. And this is only possible because joy proceeds from a love for God who is working all things for our good. Isn't that a stark contrast with the world which seeks calmness in their anger at what they would say life has thrown at them? Verse 2 here is probably one of the hardest verses in the Bible to live out. We are called to not just contentment in trial, but rather to be supremely happy when we come into times of testing. It's important to consider that James is not saying that trials are joyful in themselves, but rather as a means to an end which is joyful. We could say joy in trials coming f- comes from knowing that the outcome will be good. Our loving Father allows or sometimes sends trials upon us not to destroy us, but to develop us, to change us. And this is the key to this passage. Our joy is in that we will come out the other side of our trial more like the Lord Jesus. You may read verse 2 and, and say, well, hang on a second, it's not really a fruit, this is a command. We're to, to count or consider it all joy. Well, let's look at the verse in the context of another verse, Hebrews 12 and verse 11, where we read, All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Of course, the second part of this verse is vital. The peaceful fruit of righteousness comes to those who are trained during times of instruction and discipline. Our trials, then, form our discipline and training. We can know the fruit of joy being yielded in us if we are indeed trained by our discipline, and we learn to count our discipline as a joy. But if we fight against the training... Not only will we lose the fruit, but we'll also prolong that training process. James doesn't ask us to enjoy our trials in some kind of masochistic, kind of grin and bear it attitude. No, our trials bring grief and pain. But as Christians, with the Spirit's help, we lift our eyes above the situation to the future outcome. And in doing this, we follow our, our Saviour's supreme example, don't we? of looking to the joy before us. We read uh, in Hebrews 12, 12, the next verse on, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Just as Christ was able to endure the cross by looking to the joy before him, the joy of reconciling his loved ones to God, the joy of saving his bride, the joy of pleasing his father, the joy of knowing his church would be with him in glory, we too then should endure our trials for the joy before us, the joy of becoming more like our saviour, the joy of knowing that we will one day be perfect, the joy of resting in that whatever our current hardship, one day we will be with him. I found Warren Wisby helpful uh, in my studies. And just a, a brief quote from him. Our values determine our evaluations. If we value comfort more than character, then trials will upset us. 
If we value the material and physical more than the spiritual, we will not be able to count it all joy. If we live only for the present and forget about the future, the trials will make us bitter, not better. Let's then consider our responses to testing times. Do we bury our heads, as it were, in the present affliction, or do we look to the outcome? Do we ask, what is God wanting me to learn from this? How can I be more like the Lord in my behavior and attitude in this circumstance? Consider how Paul and Silas responded to being whipped and imprisoned. In Acts 16, verse 25, we read that in in prison they were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. That wasn't a natural response. That was a supernatural response rooted in their love for Christ and their desire to witness for him even in a prison cell. Note too that James when writes when we fall into various trials there in verse two. Verse two. He doesn't say if, because he knows that all believers following in Christ's footsteps will have times of suffering. Peter writes in 1 Peter 4:12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Here then in this verse is one of the Bible's most amazing paradoxes. There is a joy which can only be known in times of trial when we share in Christ's sufferings, fruit from the fire. If we move on to verse 3, we see a third fruit which the genuine believer finds in trial. It's the fruit of patience or endurance. What is it that produces patience in us? It is the testing of our faith. Paul writes in the same vein in Romans 5, 3, where he writes, And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. The third verse here implies the sovereignty of God. We're not dealing with a God who is trying to make the best of a bad situation, but rather he is using the trials for a purpose. What a scary world this is to the unbeliever who has no concept of God's sovereign purpose in our lives. But even as believers, how easily we we rob ourselves of the comfort this amazing doctrine holds for us. As we read in Proverbs 20, 24, man's steps are ordained by the Lord. We sang a couple of Sundays ago Francis Havergale's hymn where she writes, Every joy or trial falleth from above, traced upon our dial by the Son of Love. We may trust him fully, all for us to do. They who trust him wholly find him wholly true. Whilst holding on to God's sovereignty, our testing produces patience. I think a a better translation there is, rather than patience, is endurance. If we do not lose heart under great trials, then we will develop endurance. You might call it a, a, a spiritual toughness. Consider an athlete who is training to run a marathon. He may start off by just running a a three-kilometer run. And then over time, he builds up the length of his runs and the speed of his runs to develop stamina and endurance. He may even end up running further than a marathon so that the race will seem easier than what he is conditioned for. In the same way, then, when we endure trials by faith, our faith is stronger for the next trial. We know that we can endure because we've already been through previous trials and proved God's help and strength. If we truly and 100% hold to the amazing truth that Christ bore the penalty for all of our sin, past, present, and future, then we shouldn't look at our trials as punishments. 
Christ has already borne our penalty. Our trials, rather, are the training ground which produce endurance and spiritual strength. Or we could say that they are the, re the refining fire that makes our metal stronger, brighter, and more precious. Thomas Brooks brings numerous illustrations of this developing strength. He says, Stars shine brightest in the darkest night. Torches are the better for beating. Grapes come not to the proof till they come to the press. Spices smell sweetest when pounded. Young trees root the faster for shaking. Vines are the better for bleeding. Gold looks the brighter for scouring. And juniper smells sweeter in the fire. Scripture tells us of God's refining work. In, in Malachi 3.3 3 we read, He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. What a blessing to know that God is refining us and making us stronger. F.B. Mayer said, Dare to believe that Christ is working to a plan in your life. He loves you. Be patient. He would not take so much trouble unless he knew that it was worthwhile. Let's take to heart the truth then that the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after we have suffered a while, will perfect us, will establish us, will strengthen us, will settle us. Just as the strongest trees are those that are most exposed, we thank God that as the winds of trial blow in and out of our lives, that with his help we will endure, we will be established, strengthened, and ultimately, ultimately we will be perfect. How is it for us then? Do we know this truth for ourselves? Do we take confidence in the sovereignty of God, knowing that there is nothing beyond his control? Do testing times drive us closer to the Lord? Just like Hannah in her grief and childness wept before the Lord. Do we, do we look to our own human resources and strength when presented with circumstances which bring us physically or spiritually low? We'll find no lasting help there. Rather, let's remember the words of the hymn writer. When we have exhausted our stores of endurance... When our strength has failed, ere the day is half done. When we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's forgiving is only begun. Well, lastly, we see in verse 4 the fruit of completeness. The Christian is made complete through patience in trial. James writes at the end or at, at the end of this verse that the end goal of our trials in life is for us to be made perfect, complete. That doesn't happen in its entirety until we, we reach glory. Maturity is a process. We do not reach a point in this life where we need no further progress. It's not until glory that we shall be fully like him. We see that we are to let patience have its perfect work in us. Let have. That there, those two words, it's a present imperative. It's something that's continually going on or should be. We should be constantly letting have. Letting patience have its perfect work within us. Ultimately, this is done by submitting to God's plan for us, however hard the pathway is. It's through our weakness and our submission <clears throat> to God in our weakness that we gain spiritual strength. Paul recognized that himself, didn't he, when he wrote to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10. He said, Therefore I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. I think it's important just to note that 
submission to God and letting patience have its work in us doesn't mean that we cannot pray for relief in times of trial. Paul prayed three times, didn't he, for his thorn in the flesh to be removed. And yes, God didn't remove it, but neither did God condemn Paul for asking. Instead, Paul learnt of God's daily all-sufficient grace in the trial. There's uh, an amazing hymn which I found, which I don't know the tune to it, but uh, I'm just going to read you one of the verse, but it, verses. It just sums up these, these four verses. It's written by Susan Peterson. But uh, this one verse, Count it joy and never be discouraged when by trials your life is sorely pressed. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance then develops best. Perseverance must complete its working. You will need to let it have its way. When it's done, you'll be complete and perfect, having all you need to meet each day. Matthew Henry wrote, We must let patience have its perfect work. Do nothing to limit it nor to weaken it, but let it have its full scope. If one affliction comes upon the heels of another, and even if a train of them are drawn upon us, Yet let patience go on till work, its work is perfected. If we do this, then the promise is that we will be made perfect and complete. Indeed, Christ will present us as such on the last day. Verse 4 finishes with the phrase, lacking nothing. This tells us that there's no area of our life which doesn't need to be worked on. Every element of the fruit of Galatians 5 Galatians 5, as we've previously looked at. It can all be produced in us through the process of sanctification, through the fire of trial. It's through those times that we fruit well. And how is that possible? It's because it is Christ's completeness being worked out in us. John 1.16, for, for of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. What a wonderful future then awaits us. Don't we long for that day when we shall leave this sinful world, this this training arena, this veil of tears? Don't we rejoice that we are being transformed from one form of glory to another? Don't we rejoice that when we see him, we shall also be like him? Until then, let's also rejoice in the fact that his ways are higher than our ways that there is no temptation that we're tempted with which Christ has not also been tempted by. Let us rejoice that he is touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Let's rejoice that our high priest intercedes for us. Let's rejoice that the work he has started in us he will bring to completion. Let's rejoice that he who has promised is faithful. Let's rejoice that he will present us faultless to the Father. Let's rejoice that he promises daily grace in all our afflictions. And let us rest in the knowledge that he is working all things together for our good if we truly love him. Let us thank God that we can know fruit from the fire. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sends more strength when the labors increase. He adds to added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Amen.